Good afternoon. Good afternoon. This is Dr. Scanderberry, and it is April the 3rd, and I am coming to you live here in Delaware, representing the Dialysis Patient Citizens Educational Center, and I am here to answer your questions, get a conversation started. It's trying to get some light. I've got my Zoom light going. However, I've got my overhead light, but it's kind of dark and dreary and rainy here in Delaware. So uh, I hope you all are doing well. Uh, again, my name is Dr. Scanterbury, and um, we're here to have a discussion. So post your questions in the chat, and let's have a discussion about what's going on. This is uh, April, and certainly, I'm not sure where you are, but we're having lots of rain here in Delaware. And as you know, they say that April showers bring May flowers. So certainly, uh, we want to get started because we know that uh, you guys have a lot of questions. And um, really, in terms of what the best things to do to keep you healthy, how can you keep your phosphorus down is just... Uh, having a discussion with a patient who was um, uh, probably headed towards dialysis and the question became, you know, what things should I be eating? What things should I avoid? And it's important to to uh, really understand if you haven't had a, if you're at that point or know anyone at that point, you know that it's, it's important to really focus on the things that are not dialyzed, such as your potassium and your phosphorus, and it's important to take your phosphorus binders. I know many people see those as very large pills and they're um, often hard to swallow, but your phosphorus is important. Your binders are important to take because it helps bind the phosphorus in your diet because phosphorus is not excreted uh, or is not, um, it is not able to be cleared via the dialysis machine. So everything that you consume when it comes to phosphorus accumulates. So it's important to restrict your diet when it comes to um, minimizing those foods that are high in phosphorus. And you know, many of you are told don't drink colas or any dark sodas because they are high in phosphorus. And one of the things I found out from our dietitian is that fruit punch is also very high in phosphorus. So you want to be careful of really making a list of things that you can uh, take and also know about keeping that phosphorus down when it comes because phosphorus is one of those uh, uh, components that accumulates in your blood vessels and can really damage your blood vessels. And what we see from time to time for patients on dialysis awaiting transplant is that the phosphorus level will be seen uh, as with increasing atherosclerosis in their blood vessels. And if you ever heard of a patient who, or someone who could not be transplanted because they have too much plaque in, the, in, the, in their blood vessels, especially where the kidney needs to be transplanted, uh, to be placed, that can hinder you from getting a transplant because that can make your blood vessels very, very dense and unable to be... Um, uh, and un unable to make those connections in in order to sew that needle through that that part of the vessel because of the hard plaque. So pay attention to that. Make sure you take your binders uh, and keep your phosphorus within range and even lower if you can. So that that's an important uh, aspect. Thank you for that question. And I know someone's going to bring up that question about the artificial kidney or the new research on the pig kidney. And if I many of you have likely uh, been uh, watching the news or reading the newspaper. We know that uh, there have been a new development of a pig kidney uh, that has been genetically engineered uh, to be trans that was transplanted in a gentleman who ran out of dialysis access. And so uh, we have to remember that these, these, uh, these are stepping stones to what we hope will be in the future, the availability of more organs through um, using xenotransplantation. But when we think about how this is done, it's really about there are, there are farms that are genetically engineering these pigs 
uh, such that they remove those genes that are likely to cause rejection between a human uh, and and the pig. And so these these uh, animals are then genetically engineered such that they are likely not to see and recognize uh, that those uh, human genes as, as uh, abnormal. So these pigs are then genetically engineered to have human components of gene markers or genes that are sliced into their DNA, which make them make our body as humans less likely to recognize that uh, pig kidney is foreign. And so it does require a little bit more newer types of medications because there are there's still an issue with rejection. But the goal is that by making this pig more, having more human DNA, that our own human DNA will not necessarily see it as totally foreign as it would without the genetic engineering. Uh, and then the goal is to be able to get that kidney to uh, continue to function with minimizing rejection. One of the things that we saw in the past with other xenotransplants, whether it was other baboon transplant or other pig transplants, uh, it was that the fact that these organs were seen, despite the more novel immunosuppression, they were seen as foreign. And so the attack uh, was there. So you have to use stronger immunosuppression. Uh, but you also have to remember that one of the things in having these these pigs grown in a particular safe environment is to protect them from your normal uh, xeno uh, microbacteria. So everyone is is sort of a fear. Well, maybe we are transmitting new types of bacteria or viruses from one species to another. So these uh, animals are kept in a very sterile environment to make sure and they're tested constantly to make sure that they're not carrying uh, those viruses that we may not be able to be treated, be, may not be able to treat. So they are pretty clean when it comes, comes to infection. When you think of your normal pig that's exposed in your backyard, this is not that kind of pig. So they are very, they're kept in a sterile uh, environment, even those who are working with them so that they're not introducing any kinds of, of new viruses to those animals such that they can then be passed on through transplantation. So. I uh, hope you keep up with that because progress in terms of even though this is experimental and these types of of cases are only granted uh, permission to do them on a case by case basis. Once we have uh, more data in terms of uh, how successful they are, what kind of medications are needed, uh, those will make it much more easier down the line to be able to have uh, approval to do these transplants on a regular basis. But in it, before we get there, it'll be like pilot trials because you have to remember these are generally not covered by insurance. So your typical person will not be able to step into line quite yet without meeting the criteria. But also remember that this is also going to be uh, is more uh, on a, a person by person basis. Question, um, is it true that every minute you cut out dialysis treatment is, is a minute of your life? And you have to remember that when you think about dialysis, dialysis is there to rinse your body and get rid of the waste products. Already your kidney function is suboptimal. Uh, you have to look at how does dialysis improve your creatinine clearance? And is it, is it going, are you doing better with dialysis? But remember, even though you're on dialysis, your clearance is still going to be most often less than 20%. So you're just taking off the overflow to keep you uh, from getting too toxic. And you are consuming uh, substances th three times a day. So you're eating meals, whether it's twice a day or three times a day or more you're adding more and more metabolites. And what that does is that you now have much more to clear. Uh, and so it becomes important to know that dialysis at its best should be done daily. So when you're doing it every other day, you're only taking off extreme excess. And so when you cut your dialysis short, you're allowing more substances that should be uh, cleared from your body to remain in your body. 
Uh, and so your metabolites and all those bad products are going to play havoc on your system. So you don't need to be cutting your dialysis short. Uh, that is why patients who have are on dialysis daily with home dialysis or peritoneal dialysis uh, feel better because as you eat, you are able to cleanse your body at the end of the day. And so therefore, you're not accumulating as many waste products. When you do it every other day, you have much more uh, work on that dialysis machine and you really cannot afford to cut your dialysis short. You are definitely uh, cutting your life short because you're allowing more metabolites to stay within your body and that can cause much more detriment, whether it's to your heart, whether it's to your brain, uh, depositions can occur, so it becomes important to do that. So again, I'm Dr. Scannerberry and I am a medical consultant for DPC Educational Center and this is Ask the Doctor. So if you have any questions, uh, if you want to talk about transplant, if you want to talk about dialysis, we want to know uh, uh, anything regarding some of the medications and your treatment options uh, that are available. Uh, some patients, uh, again, I'm speaking to another young lady who uh, just last night it was referred to me and she is refusing dialysis because she thinks her doctor is pushing her uh, to get dialysis. And it's really about understanding that what are your options? Uh, she says, I'm not going to do it. But if you choose not to do it, what are your options? Uh, if you have someone who can give you a transplant, then you still have to go through the transplant workup. Uh, and if you don't, uh, what are your options for hemodialysis, uh, peritoneal dialysis? Understanding that if you refuse dialysis, then your body may continue to deteriorate. Some people feel that this dialysis is only going to be temporary you need to have that discussion with your doctor because it all depends on the on what caused your kidney function. So that becomes something to discuss. So it's really important to know what are your options if you're if you are diagnosed early with stage three or stage four, going on four to five, then you have much more time to sit down with your doctor and say, uh, what is best for me? Before I get this fistula or this graft, uh, what are the options for peritoneal dialysis? What are the pros and cons? Can I go straight to transplant? Many patients are still under the impression that they need to hit dialysis and be dialyzed for a while before they can be referred to transplant. And that is not true. So understanding your options, getting educated, having a conversation with your nephrologist, um, asking them to maybe connect you with someone who is on dialysis, who is on peritoneal dialysis, they also have many uh, educational videos that are out there that allows you to know what is the difference between peritoneal dialysis, what it involves in terms of home dialysis, and what do I need to go, what do I need to do to get there? Uh, to get home dialysis, you have to understand, you have to learn how to dialyze yourself. You're taught in center dialysis, uh, and you work that out so that you can do that at home after being. Uh, taught within the dialysis unit. Understanding what PD is, it's a catheter that's placed in your abdomen uh, and it's something you do every day to exchange a fluid. Many patients that go, oh no, I'm not going to do that, but get the information first. Uh, see the videos, talk to the nurse specialist so that they're understanding, so that you can gain more information before you dismiss it or decide that this is not something for you. Because the, you know, one of the things is that certainly um, many patients gravitate towards in-center dialysis because they're afraid of doing it themselves. Oh, I can't stick myself. Uh, but gradually you get there, you're taught how to do that. And when you are able to dialyze yourself much more frequently, the better off you are. So if you can do home dialysis and you have the option of doing it five days a week, uh, you give your body, you have that sense of consuming and rinsing your body. So you feel better, your heart does better, your fluid status, it does better. And so you're not having that dramatic rise in your weight over two or three days and pulling off that weight, all that excess fluid on dialysis uh, when you go three days a week. So that's important to understand. So Certainly, you want to know what are the benefits and what are the disadvantages. Do you have someone who can help you? Uh, are you comfortable doing it by yourself? 
um, uh, those kind of things. And do you have to take care of someone? Uh, do you have pets that you have run in and out? Then, you know, those are things that you may not be able to do. And you may have to consider your whole environment of where you're going to dialyze. So uh, a lot of information, but it's better to have all the information uh, and have it lay out in front of you so that you know uh, what are the better options for you. And, you, you know, many people will complain about being tired and fatigued and they're anemic, but you have to realize that anemia is a side effect of kidney disease. Your kidneys are no longer making that hormone that keeps you from, uh, that allows you to make enough uh, hemoglobin. So for many patients on dialysis, if they're pre-dialysis and they're not there yet, they may have to get that shot to stimulate their, their bone marrow to make more of the red blood cells. Uh, but when you get on dialysis, you're then given that shot on the dialysis machine, so you're not necessarily having to go to the doctor's office to receive that uh, epogen shot or uh, all, or another alternative. So thank you so much for the question. What is the parathyroid and what medicines treat this condition? And we talked about this some time ago. Parathyroids are four little glands that are, sit in your neck above and below your thyroid, which is also a bigger gland that sits in your neck. And your parathyroid um, uh, helps control uh, your, regulate your calcium balance. Uh, your parathyroid hormone, um, it gets stimulated. And so when your calcium level is low, it makes more. Uh, and so during dialysis or with kidney disease, what happens is that we will get up to a point where the parathyroid hormone uh, gets to get stimulated, but it gets run off by uh, on its own, and it's no longer responding to the body's uh, stimuli. So for some patients, their parathyroid hormones gets very high, uh, and so you measure PTH while you're on dialysis or chronic renal disease with end-stage renal disease. And for some patients, they may get enlargement of these glands in the neck, and so these parathyroid uh, can what we can get hyperplasia uh, in that they increase in size and they're being overworked. Some patients will have all four being enlarged and being an overwork. And so, or you may have an adenoma, which is that one goes off and gets to get, goes havoc and, and, and uh, produce much more PTH. And so for many, for many patients, they may require surgery to remove these excess glands, sometimes of pieces placed in your arm under your muscle so that you don't want to remove all of them. They may remove three and a half, they may leave a half in your neck or place that extra half in your arm so that you can still have parathyroid hormone being uh, excreted, but it's now in a place that if it continues to excrete more and more, they can reduce the size because you don't want to have over excess. It can lead to bone disease uh, and many other issues with your calcium phosphorus metabolism. So thank you so much for that question. And the goal is that while you are on dialysis, this is the job of your nephrologist. They're going to monitor your, your parathyroid hormone. If it's high, they're going to give you, try to give you medications to help to reduce the level um, so that it can be within range. They measure your calcium levels, make sure your calcium phosphorus is, is um, within normal. Uh, and the goal is also to keep you from, uh, we talked about epigen, that, those are blood work that's done on a regular basis while you are on dialysis so that your, your healthcare provider can monitor and treat you accordingly so that you are uh, doing the best that you can for that duration of time. Another question. Patients who have catheters are reluctant to get fistulas. How can they be convinced to make the changes as soon as possible? You know, it's, it's easier for the patient. Uh, if you have a catheter in your neck and then you were being dialyzed, you're not being, you, you, once you, you know you go to sleep, you have that catheter place uh, and now you feel, well, now it's so much easier to be dialyzed because someone else comes and it connects to that catheter and you don't have to get stuck. If you get a fistula, you go, okay, but now I have to get 
uh, every time I go to dialysis, I have to get stuck to have my dialysis. So this leaves a sense of comfort having this catheter in your neck. But remember, it's a foreign body and it's usually about four to five inches. And so this catheter goes into your, your subclavian vein uh, and then into the beginning part of your, your um, right heart. Is sitting there and so as a foreign body it's going to cause accumulation of material whether it's platelets and fibrin and debris and so rather and so over time you can that the presence of that catheter in your vein can create narrowing of that vein and so what happens is that you then have decreased outflow or obstruction to blood returning to your heart because now that vein, which might be a centimeter across before you inserted that catheter, and now that catheter is, is uh, occupying the majority of the lumen of that vein and the outside of, and so the, the, the catheter, the, your vessel forms a reaction to having that catheter there. And so it becomes narrow and narrower. And so you can have flow obstruction. It can become stenosis or very narrowed. Uh, it can clot and you can also get infections in that catheter, which becomes an issue. So you are reluctant, but remember the long-term consequence is that if you end up with stenosis or narrowing on one side, you change the catheter to the other side. Now you decrease your access to any kind of emergency surgery that you may need, which now you no longer can get a catheter up here. Uh, going to transplant, uh, putting patients to sleep, we find it almost very difficult to access these uh, these veins here and you then have to use it in the neck. Uh, and two, you then can end up with problems of draining, returning blood to your heart. So it's become, you don't want to keep these long-term, one, because of the narrowing of your vessels uh, long-term, and two, the risk of infection. So go ahead and get your fistula because over time that's going to be your lifeline. Uh, this can be, uh, having the catheter can be uh, fraught with complications. It can cause sepsis, uh, which is when you get bacteria getting into your bloodstream, which then goes from not just this catheter, but to other areas in your body. It can cause pneumonia. It can cause a blood infection that can then travel to other parts of your body and almost compromise your life if you are if it's not treated early so that's very very important to remember it's a source and of infection that can be devastating so thank you for that for those of you who might have had your catheter for a long time and did well with it kudos to you but um, it is meant to be a temporary form of dialysis and not a long-term form of dialysis because for many patients, they have to come back to that lifeline uh, when it becomes necessary. Uh, some patients are afraid of kidney transplantation. How can they feel more comfortable about the process? I think the, the more you learn about the process as early on as possible, knowing about your options when you are in stage four and stage five before you even need to go to dialysis. Understand it. I think this is where education is really key. Really arming yourself or again, talking to others. If you are reluctant or feel, ah, oh, this is not for me. Talk to a patient who's been on dialysis for a while and who got a transplant. There are many patients who don't do well with a transplant. And sometimes as a surgeon, we discourage them. But they say, you know, for that time I was I had that functioning kidney, it was so much better than being on dialysis. So you may not, you may see it as a disadvantage, but remember having that transplant is going to be restoring your kidney function. And while only one kidney is necessary, uh, and most of us have two, only with that one kidney, you will, you will be successful if that kidney works and do well to having a pretty normal kidney function. It reverses or decreases your risk of further heart disease because while you're on dialysis and you are, your kidney function is still less than 20%, you are putting yourself at risk for more and more heart disease, especially when it comes to hemodialysis. 
more bone disease, more risk of infections. So by having a kidney transplant, you are restoring what we call homeostasis of your body. You're now able to excrete those things that you were not able to excrete. One of the things you notice with patients who go from dialysis to transplant is just the color change. If you've been on dialysis for a while, you'll notice that your skin color is different because you have accumulation of a lot of those metabolites uh, and waste products that normally are excreted are begin to accumulate in your body. And while you may feel fine, those de things are being deposited. After transplant, even your skin color can return to normal. Uh, it prevents that bone disease that can be a long-term issue with patients on, on hemodialysis. And it, now you have better regulation of that calcium, phosphorus. You're not limited in your diet as much. You can eat much more than you could when you were on hemodialysis. Now you're able to urinate more. And so now you have better homeostasis when it comes to fluid balance. Uh, and that restriction uh, for many patients is lifted. Certainly you want to continue to monitor your salt intake uh, and be cognizant of your diet. You don't want to overdo it after your transplant. But many of the restrictions are become uh, allow you to live as close to a normal life as possible because with that kidney, once it starts to work, gradually your function improves, uh, your blood pressure gets better, you're, you're, not, um, uh, you're able to eat many more things than you were, your, your potassium is not as much of an issue. Some patients will continue to have some mild problems with potassium, but nothing like when you're on dialysis. So... Arm yourself with information. That is the key. Don't dismiss it. Find out the pros and cons. Uh, sorry, I'm, we're having uh, lots of rain here, so my internet is in and out, but we're coming to the end of the hour. So for those who, if you know someone who is dismissing it, uh, just connect them with someone who's had a transplant so they can talk about the process. Understand the process of the evaluation process, which may seem a little rigorous, uh, but it's always about getting you to that healthy point so that you can tolerate a kidney and that you can do well after that transplant so that you're not debilitated by the whole process. Uh, and if you, if you want to know more about living donors, do you have someone who can donate to you and is afraid of asking that donor, know that there are benefits to uh, having a living donor. You're not waiting on the transplant list. Uh, as long because that person is going to donate to you or if they're going to enter a, uh, a peer donor exchange, they will donate to someone else who will donate to you. That's something else that you also can have a long discussion about. And lastly, I want to mention uh, there was an article that came out at NBC News that uh, uh, someone sent to me this morning about a patient who was able to get transplanted because she had been on the transplant list um, and because of the new uh, allocation of um, changing of EGFR, she was able to gain five years uh, after they recalculated her time uh, and the fact that her EGFR was miscalculated based by that race factor. Uh, and they interviewed her and she talked about her journey of being called uh, to now say, now you have this extra five years and you can get transplanted and she received her transplant. And so for many patients who are, are of African descent and that race factor was in the EGFR are now being able to get extra time, uh, waiting time, which puts them ahead of the game to be able to get transplanted because of that um, a negative race factor that was uh, in the equations for EGFR. So something to talk to your nephrologist about uh, if you're an African-American and have been have waiting time uh, while on dialysis or while before you hit dialysis if you have years on the waiting list before you hit dialysis you may be able to recoup some of that time based on the calculation of your EGFR so thank you all today the time seemed to have gone by pretty fast I've been talking endlessly but I hope I was able to answer your questions and um, have a great day uh, enjoy the rest of the day, even if it's raining and you're inside. Have a wonderful day. Thank you and God bless and we'll see you next time. Take care.